And I just wanted to start with um, some stuff that came up, uh, and I'm sure you guys are getting these emails um, in your LaGuardia email, but you know, sometimes we get such an overwhelming amount of communication that it just helps for someone to point out, you know, what's going on uh, or to highlight some stuff. Um, you, we've already spoken at length about the vaccine uh, requirement for students, and so I don't need to repeat to you that that it is required if you have classes that are marked as in person or hybrid. But I, I just want to this. This is from the president of the college. This came to to faculty and staff. I just received this literally this morning. Um, but I, I did want to highlight here in case anybody is you know still. Let me see if I make this a little bit bigger, please. Or oh, maybe not. Okay. Um, all students coming to campus after Thursday. So Thursday is when they're finishing kind of like the, the audit of all the vaccine um, vaccination uploads. Um, after Thursday, October 21st, so that's next week, Thursday, must be fully vaccinated and have their proof of vaccination in CUNY first, whether they are attending a class or entering a college building or for any other reason. Students with approved religious exemptions or medical exemptions may enter the campus when they present a negative PCR test from a CUNY testing site. All students, including those taking entirely remote classes, are strongly encouraged to get vaccinated and upload the vaccination documents. So I just want to be clear here. I know that some people are like, well, I'll never take a, an in-person class again. I don't plan to get vaccinated. You know, it's all good, etc. But please be careful. Um, you know, you may not need to do anything this semester, but maybe next semester, if you actually do have to put a foot on campus, um, they're going to be looking for uh, vaccination documents in, uh, you know, your proof of vaccination in CUNY first. So um, I guess my point is, make, if you do have the information, just upload it and know that you're done. I, I uh, uploaded my stuff long ago and I'm not even on campus and I probably won't be on campus until March. But the point is, you don't have to think about it again, because if you suddenly need to go onto campus for some reason, other than class even, um, and you don't have an approved religious exemption that you got through the school or medical exemption or, or something, you know, that that shows or you got it through your work or whatever that you have an exemption, then you still have to bring a PCR test. So, I mean, it kind of, it kind of limits your movement because uh, you need to make sure that you have a PCR test from an actual CUNY testing site. And the, he's saying here yeah, that the vaccine mandate will remain in place for fall two. So again, if you registered for classes for fall two that um, are in person or hybrid, then you need to be aware that you know it's, it could become a problem if you don't have documents in the system. And spring semester, and he's saying perhaps longer. Um, I'm sorry. Uploading the vaccination documents will be an ongoing requirement for new students and con uh, continuing students who intend to come to campus for any reason. And this is similar to everybody had to be uh, vaccinated for MMR, right? Measles, mountain rubella, uh, before you can even come uh, take classes at the college. And then this is what I was talking about. Uh, and again, this may not apply to anybody in this class, but I don't want this to apply to you in a future semester because you, you know, didn't upload your documents. As of yesterday, so the 13th, there are still over 1,000 LaGuardia students at risk of administrat administrative withdrawal. Remember, they said if you don't upload your documents, you the CUNY Central will administratively withdraw students. This is not uh, LaGuardia making up stuff and, and so on. I mean, frankly, uh, this is across the board in CUNY that students will be get a WA grade if they don't um, if they don't upload their documents and they're supposed to come to campus for a hybrid or in-person class. I strongly urge anyone who was maybe asleep or didn't care or thought this didn't apply to them or whatever, I strongly urge you to check your schedule in CUNY first to make sure that you don't have a class that is listed as hybrid or in-person and you didn't realize that um, because you will be, if you don't have your vaccine documentation uploaded, you, you can end up getting a WA grade, okay? And, and that's not a good look. Um, and yeah, this is just for for um, 
this is about for faculty, but um, CUNY will notify all of us when they start issuing the WA grades. Looking ahead to spring, like I told you before, about 70% of courses will be offered in person. The, the remaining 30% will be either hybrid or fully remote. And so that's being you know, finalized. So like I said before, if you think, okay, I'll just be doing online classes forever, um, and that's fine. I mean, listen, it's it's entirely up to you how you decide to run your life. Please note that the number of online offerings are going to be drastically less for spring than they've been since the start, you know, of the pandemic. So don't, you know, go in and look to see which classes you want to take in the spring. Don't hesitate to see if they are actually being offered, you know, online. Uh, the the um the registration date for to, the starting registration date for for spring was supposed to be tomorrow. It's now been pushed um, back ten days to October the twenty fifth, and I think it's because of the fact that they are still trying to sort out the seventy thirty split between remote and and in person, and then. Um, there is a vaccination ban that's that's like literally right outside LaGuardia from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It will be there until Sunday, October the 17th. Um, and obviously everything is is free and the rest is not relevant to our class. But I'm just um, the last day of uploading was October um, for us was was pushed to October the 7th. That was actually uh, uh, an extension of the previous date, which was September something. So you were supposed to upload by October uh, the 7th. Um, I know, Sam, that at one point you were emailing me about having some issue, and I think we were talking back and forth. If you are still having some problem, um, to stay back at the end of the class. Let me try to help you to make sure that there isn't still an ongoing issue. If anybody does have a, a problem with uploading, um, or if somebody uh, isn't sure whether their schedule is actually uh, in person or hybrid and needs me to help them look at it. Yeah, I think they were uh, I think they were looking for fully vaccinated, it says here. Yeah, so if you did Johnson and Johnson and you did one dose, then you're fully vaccinated. If you um if you so, so yeah, do you see how it says fully vaccinated? So I mean, if you did Moderna or Pfizer, then then you needed to get your second dose to be fully vaccinated. So, but again, um, talk to me because I I think that um, you know, I I think that no one wants anyone to be administratively withdrawn because they're struggling to upload documents or something. So Sam, um, let's talk either during the break or at the end of class, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, let's make sure that you you have what you need. I thought I recalled that you weren't taking any classes in person anyway, so it wasn't such a big deal. Yeah, let's talk at the end of class, okay. Okay, is there any, any other questions that, um, when do they open the spring classes to sign up? So it was supposed to be tomorrow, see, but it's it's now been moved excuse me, pardon me, it's been moved to October the 25th. And I think honestly, the, because we did our spring, we call it passes, like when the professors say what which classes they're gonna take, we've done it almost, um, you know, months ago, but that was before this mandate came from CUNY that said it has to be 70-30 split. So everything had to change. So I think they've moved it back by 10 days because, um, because of, of this issue. Whether the classes are already uploaded into the system and available for you to see what is being offered, I'm not sure, they might be. Um, so I think just watch CUNY first to see, because you, know, you wanna be able to, when your registration appointment becomes available, like when it, the system opens up for you to register, you you probably don't want to at that stage, you know, take a week to decide which classes you're going to be registering for, because by the time you come back, uh, many of those classes will probably be gone already. Okay, so that's a great question. Do you have to be fully vaccinated when signing up for in-person spring classes? Excellent question, uh, Michelle. I also asked, uh, I asked a similar question when the president was doing his town hall on Friday. M my understanding at this point, based on what he said, in terms of the communication from CUNY, and remember all these things shift <laughs> as you go along sometimes, is that students will be able to register for in-person classes even if their vaccination documentation is not 
in the system, you know, like in, for spring, you can register for in-person classes. But I think uh, by 10 days before classes start, if you have not uploaded your vaccination documents into the system, you will be dropped from the class. So that's, I think that's how they're going to run um, that. So, so, you know, I, I don't know if they're gonna change this to, you now do have to be fully vaccinated because I, I don't know how administratively they're going to um, know exactly who, you know, who should be dropped or not, but that's the work they're giving themselves. Apparently they think they can do that within 10 days from the start of class. I think it's, um, it might be a little bit ambitious because a lot of people register late, you know, like days before class starts, but maybe they'll tell those people they have to be vaccinated. I don't know. But um, this is why I'm saying, no, you don't have to be vaccinated by October the 25th to start registering. But why I'm saying that if you're already vaccinated and you have your documents, just upload them so you know you're done. You don't even have to think about this again. If you set foot on campus for whatever reason, you have your documents in the system. And remember, I sent out an email that has the video and, and stuff that, that helps you to show how you should upload the documents. Um, and if you don't have that little white card anymore, you can use the Excel share pass to, to, um, as, as a way to, to upload your vaccination status. And if you want to register for spring, yes, you can register without being vaccinated. But if remember, there's like a month, if you take the, the Pfizer or Moderna, um, vaccine, there's like three weeks to a month between the shots, right? So it may seem like far away, like spring semester is only starting the big, you know, the first week of March. But if you can't back, you have to be, you would have to be vaccinated by about the middle of February. And so that means that you're, you're you know, fully vaccinated, which means your, your second dose must have happened around the beginning of February, which means your first dose should be happening around the beginning of January. I know we're in October, but I just want to make sure that people are and thinking, oh, well, I can wait till the spring to get vaccinated. Um, that's not how this is going to go. All right. Any other questions about this whole business with vaccines? Okay. I, what I will say is I'm not sure about the process around the uh, medical and religious um, exemption. Of course, if, of course, you should be able to be exempt if you have a, a medical or religious uh, uh, situation, but I, I suspect you would have to show uh, proper documents that are valid from whether it be a religious, you know, leader in your community, whomever that may be, to explain, uh, you know, how this vaccination situation is, is in contradiction or whatever to your beliefs. And then secondly, for the medical thing, it would have to be a medical doctor, um, you know, that's saying that due to whatever condition that you have that is shown to be a problem with vaccine, with this vaccine, that you wouldn't be able to take it. So I don't think we can just, uh, you know, try to go to admissions and say, well, I can't, I'm not getting vaccinated because I don't believe in vaccines or something. It's not going to fly. All right. They need proper documentation. And then remember, if you do do that, you are still going to be in a situation where when you come on campus, you're going to have to have a negative PCR test. And the PCR test is the long one. You know, the one that it's not, it's the one that could take a day or two to, to come through. So just, you know, bear these things in mind as you think about registering for classes. All right, so let's, let's uh, stop that discussion. Um, okay, and move on to uh, going through chapter 13 homework. Like I said, we'll do chapter 13 homework just to, to for me to review it with you, make sure that everybody understands why they got everything right or if they got something wrong, why that is. Um, this is not necessarily, you know, line by line that I'm going through this stuff. I just want to remind you, um, actually before I go through this, I should have done this first. Um, just to remind you that the chapter 14 homework is due on the 26th, um, Tuesday, the 26th of October. Again, it sounds like it's super far away. It's like 12 days away, but um, there's, you know, reasonable amount of questions. You could start doing, you know, one question a day and be done long before the, the deadline. On the same day that that homework is due, and this is normally how I set it up, your test and quiz, sorry, will open up on Wiley. Um, 
and you'll have a window between the 26th of October and the 2nd of November to complete the test and the quiz. Um, that doesn't mean that you can start the, the test on the 26th and only finish it on the 2nd. You have, once you click start, you have to finish it in one sitting for the hours that are given to you. Um, but I'm saying any day within that window, a day that suits you, because I know sometimes people work and if I just had to open it on one day and close it, people wouldn't be able to do, you know, do the work. You've got other classes that you need to. So you choose which day you want to do it, but you got to do it in one shot. So if you start the, like I, I think I told you guys before, but I'm just emphasizing this because I get this question all the time, no matter how many times I say it in class. If I start the test at 11 o'clock and the test is for four hours, I only have until three o'clock in the afternoon to finish it. So if I start the test and I get up, I go make coffee, I make something to eat, I do all kinds of stuff, the clock is still running. Okay, even if I turn off my computer, the clock is not running on your computer, it's running at Wiley's, you know, on Wiley's site, so you're going to lose time. So please make sure that when you decide on a day to do the test and the quiz, it's not like the homework with unlimited attempts and no time limit and whatever, they, they are very specific um, time restrictions and attempt restrictions, which, you know, will go over closer to the time. But if you're really curious, you will read over here on the testing quiz information. All right. So Tuesday, the 26th, chapter 14 homework is due. Chapter 13 homework was due this week. So I'm going to go over it now. <clears throat> and so we start with brief exercise 13.2. This is a, a an granted I think you know this already these questions are algorithmic so my numbers are not going to be the same as yours everybody has different numbers but we have the same question so when I'm going over this you should be focusing not on the fact that my numbers don't uh, agree to yours but focusing on whether you have the correct journal entries the way the same way they are on here or whether you understand you know why the journal entry is the way it is so this company has 624,000 of net income they're asking you to prepare the entry to close Closed net income. This should be a hint to you that this is a closing journal entry, right? And that um, you need to know when we close uh, income for companies, we don't close to a capital, like a owner's capital or partner's capital account, we close to retained earnings, which represents the earned capital of the company. Uh, please follow the instructions as always, right? We want the debits first, the credits um, afterwards. You know, for the life of me, I don't know how to get rid of this thing. I spent about five minutes after one class to try and disable it, and it didn't want to be disabled. <clears throat> um, anyway, so debit income summary, which is closing the income summary account and credits retained earnings. Simple, right? That was like the first thing we did when we started um, uh, corporations. Then it says on the 10th of May, the cor this corporation issues 2,200 shares of $10 par value common stock for cash at $20 per share. So this is a really, so I'm easing you in, you could probably see with our work, I was easing you in to, you know, how to do this work. You, you're doing a stock issuance, it's the type of stock is common stock, the number of shares is 2,200. We already know from our previous work that um, the common stock will formula, right, is the number number of shares times the par or stated value. If you have a par stated value, if there's no par value, you, whatever you debit to cash, you credit to common stock. In this case, we have a par value. So common stock is credited with 22,000, which is the 2,200 times 10. Cash is debited, you're receiving cash with 44,000. The excess, it's an even split, right, between common stock and paid in capital and excess of par. When you have this drop down, um, menus to choose an account, make sure that you are paying attention to detail, right? If this had said stated value, you would have to put stated value as the as the account name. I'm flying through because, you know, most everybody did this work and I, I'm not trying to reteach it, but I, I just want to make sure that we close the loop and go over uh, in case there are any tricky bits. On June the 1st, Swifty Inc. issues 3,400 shares of no par common stock at a cash price of $7 per share. Generalize the issuance of the shares, assuming that the stock has a stated value of $2 per share. So this is basically what I was just talking about earlier. So 3,400 times the issue price of $7, that's what goes into cash. That's the cash that you actually receive. 3,400 times the stated value, the 6,800 is what you put to common stock. And the excess is the paid in capital 
capital in excess of, notice the different stated value, right? Common stock. So again, pretty straightforward, or at least I think it's straightforward. Now we get a little bit more exciting here um, with Flounder Corporation. They issued 2,400 shares of stock. So, you know, yeah, I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit. Um, <laughs> surprise, right? Um, I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit and say that one of the key things that I think personally for my own success <laughs> from a very young age has been reading. Um, I know it sounds like it might sound crazy, but reading, um, being able to, like, I enjoy reading. I think that being able to read questions, being able to read, uh, you know, whether it's a syllabus or reading instructions, things like that, reading things closely is actually uh, critical to, uh, or a very critical part to, to being a successful student, professional, et cetera. So, you know, I think, um, and again, I'm on my soapbox, so just bear with me, but I'll say it quickly. Um, I think that reading is actually more and more over time. I'm going to sound like super old and fuddy daddy now. More and more over time is, is like a lost art that people generally skim things. We are so bombarded by information and there's so much dopamine being released in our brains when we're on social media and stuff and we're just scrolling from one thing to the next. It's almost, it's, it's the same reaction that you would have in your brain if you were on drugs that, you know, that we get when we're um, seeing all these things on social media. So it's, you know, stopping to read something carefully and so on is, is, is almost like it's, you know, it's keeping you away from getting that hit that, that you want to get. But what I will say, guys, is especially in this class and, and think about this for your other classes also, um, being, you know, being a student, being a scholar, uh, being in some type of academic pursuit does require you to, to stop and to read things uh, carefully. And in this case, I know that, um, you know, this is a very simplistic example, and I can give many others of how reading is important. But if you're just flying into, you know, part A, the stock at a par value of 550, and it was issued for 53,000, and you're not stopping to read what's going on above here, you could, you could spin your wheels for a while trying to figure out like, but you know, how do I know where's the number of shares? And maybe this example less so, but there are a few others where there's like paragraphs of stuff at the beginning that sometimes people just want to skip over because it's kind of boring to read right this morning. Um, so now I'm really going off on a tangent, but I'm trying to keep everybody awake. Um, this morning I was speaking to my four-year-old when I was stressing her to go to school and she was like, um, oh yeah, I, I was trying to talk to her about something. She's like, no, I want to watch my, my tablet because this is boring, right? So, um, so that's the word of the day. It's super boring um, to, to do certain things. But, you know, it's way more exciting to, to watch Daniel Tiger on the tablet, but, um, and I think she's, she's progressed from Daniel Tiger, but um, sometimes boring things are, are what we need to do for, for what we would call delayed gratification for a payoff um, in the future. So now I'll step off my soapbox and all you need to remember is that reading is important, okay? Thanks for, you know, attending my very, boring TED talk. So Flander Corporation issued 2,400 shares of stock, prepare the entry for the issuance under the following assumption. The stock had a par value of 550 per share and was issued for a total of 53,000. So the cash that you're getting here is 53,000, right? Um, what do we do to common stock? It's the number of shares times the par value, obviously. So that's 13,200. You can plug the paid in capital in excess of par. You say 53,000 minus 13,200. So 39,800 is the paid in capital in excess of par. And then the stock had a stated value. Again, notice how you have to read closely to make sure that you, you see that now there's a slight change, even though everything looks exactly the same, right? One word changed, but it changes uh, which account you are going to credit, which if you were doing this as your job, um, you know, the stakes are high to make sure that you're actually recording things properly. So 53,000 again to cash the same amount to common stock, but now you have paid in capital in excess of stated value. 
Stephen stock had no par or stated value and was issued for 53,000. So this is a nice question because you can see all the different scenarios. So debit cash, 53,000. And we saw this before when we did this for classwork. Uh, credit common stock, right? 53,000. So because you have no par value and no stated value, you basically dump everything into common stock because you can't differentiate between what part of the money went to the capital stock, uh, excuse me, and what part went to additional paid in capital. So it all just goes into common stock. For D, it says that the stock had a bar value of 550. So it's kind of going back to the same as what was in A. Question was issued to attorneys for services during corporation. So if you spend some time in the, in the textbook, you'll see they sometimes call it organization fee, which is probably what they'll call it here. They also call it attorney fee. But if it's for... Uh, you know, during cooperation, it's more likely they're not going to be called organization fees. So that's a 53,000 organization fees. So this question is keeping all the numbers on the debit side, right, to 53,000. So debit organization expense, that's for the attorney fee. You credit the common stock with the number of shares times the par value. So it's 550, right? Where's the number of shares? Again, 2,400, so it's the same number as before. And then the paid in capital in excess of par is at 39,800. And then, so now you're issuing stock for non-cash expenses. And in the last one, you issue stock for non-cash assets, for land worth, that word is important, worth 53,000. You don't have any other options, right? So they, they kind of made this easy. It's not like you have a market price for the stock or they said that the land was advertised for some amount or whatever. It's it's just very obviously that you're going to have to debit land with 53,000 and the rest remains the same. So a nice um, a nice question to kind of uh, test your, your muscles here with whether you know how to do stock issuance for the stock being at par, no par, uh, no par with a stated value, issuing stock for non-cash um, expenses, issuing stock for non-cash assets. It basically covers, it runs the gamut of everything that you need to know. So good practice question. Um, here we go with treasury stock. Okay, on July the 1st, Bramble Corporation purchases 670 shares of its $5 par value common stock. So, so yeah, I'm talking again about reading the questions carefully because sometimes with treasury stock, and, and admittedly, you can see how this could happen, when you're so much in the zone of, um, of uh, issuing stock, right? Selling shares, so when you suddenly get a treasury stock uh, question, um, you might think that it's also a, a stock issuance and start doing cash and common stock and all of that. So you have to read carefully that it's uh, purchasing, right? Not issuing, purchasing. It's $5 par value common stock for the treasury at a price of $9 per share. Here we are reminded that we use the cost method for treasury stock. So even though there's a $5 par value, we, we ignore that and we focus on the amount that we actually paid for the shares. So on July the 1st, we're going to debit treasury stock. Remember, treasury stock is um, a contra stockholders equity account, which means it's, it's stockholders equity. It goes into that part of the balance sheet, but it increases on the debit side. And it is shown as a deduction, right, from stockholders equity. So you're saying 670 times nine, and that's where the 6030 comes from. You completely ignore the $5 par value. Um, and then credit cash, because you're paying cash to the people who you are buying the shares from. Let me see what's, why this is happening. Okay. And that's it. So there's no common, even though they're buying common stock, you don't call it common stock, it's treasury stock, because we're indicating that it's being held in the treasury. And then on September 1st, they, they sell some of the treasury stock. They're selling it above cost. You can see here, because cost was nine. Now they're selling it for 14. You calculate the cash received as the number of shares times the, the selling price, which is 420 times 14. So that's 5880. The treasury stock, and this is where people usually make mistakes, you have to take it out at the same cost that you put it in. So it's going to be 420 shares times $9 as the cost per share, not times 14, okay? 420 times 9 is the 3780, and the difference goes into that account that we created, we've done this before in class, right? Paid in capital from treasury stock. 
So that's a nice example of purchase of treasury stock and then the subsequent sale of the treasury stock above cost. Again, if there's something you need to know, um, you can ask me while I'm going through this. I'm flying through it because my assumption is that, you know, I know also from looking that people did the homework, people know what's going on, but um, sometimes we get stuff right or we kind of battle through to get it right. And then at the end, we're still not quite sure why we got it right. And for those who, who didn't get to, to do all of this, it might be a helpful thing to do. And then of course, this is being recorded. So if you really get stuck while you're studying, you can always listen to, to some of the explanations again. Um, so 1311 is asking you to prepare the stockholders equity section of the balance sheet. Okay, stockholders equity sections so are from the top down, all the names. This is in contrast to, let me just show you because people had a really, I got about three questions about this, even though I did say something in class, but I knew the questions were gonna come. This is different to number seven that asks you to do the paid in capital section. I know this, I mean, I, I'm often frustrated by this because it's kind of like, okay, why, does, why, what's the big deal to just do the paid in capital section? But a few people emailed me to say, I put stockholders equity over here in number seven and, and it's being marked wrong. And I'm like, yes, because when you read the, the, the question, it's asking you specifically for the paid in capital section. So for, you know, for that reason, they're starting the first heading as paid in capital. Um, you know, from a learning perspective, I'm not sure how much learning that really, uh, you know, from a like preparing the balance sheet perspective, how much learning that really, um, Ads, but from a reading perspective, which seems to be becoming the theme for me today, even if it's just me, from a reading perspective, there's a lot of learning here because if you read the question closely and ask yourself, what are they really asking? They're not asking for the entire stockholders equity section. They're just asking for a portion of it, which is the paid in capital. Okay, I know it's frustrating um, sometimes, but you know, sometimes we learn more with the things that we were struggling with and the things that were easy. So in this case, prepare the stockholders equity section at December 31, 2022. So the following, um, Stockholders equity accounts are arranged alphabetically. So now you say, why do they say that? Because they're trying to say that this is not necessarily the order in which you will put them in the balance sheet. They're just arranged this way, um, you know, by, by the first letter of the word and, and the order of the alphabet. So you have to know what goes where, okay? This is in the ledger of Novak Corporation. And so common stock at a $6 stated value. This is a beginning balance, right? Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say begin, but ending or beginning. Let's, let's call it ending December 31, 22, which would be beginning for January. I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's nothing for, for anyone to do at this point in terms of journalizing anything. There's no adjustment you need to make to the number. They're literally just asking you to put these numbers into a balance sheet in the order and the places where they belong. There's paid in capital in excess of power for preferred stock, for uh, in excess of stated value for common stock. There's a preferred stock with an 8% difference on a $103 par. You don't have to do anything to this number. The balance is already given to you. Retained earnings, 1,150,000. They show you that this company has treasury stocks. They obviously bought some stock back, 126,000. At this point, it's up to you to know that treasury stock has to be subtracted. So. Because they ask you for stockholders equity, you start with the heading stockholders equity, then you put paid in capital, then it's capital stock. Remember, I told you this is, it's really tedious, okay, uh, to, to always remember all of the stuff. Illustration 1311 in the textbook um, shows you everything that you need to know for balance sheet. So if you find that you are like, oh my word, I can't remember like the order of these things, um, you don't have to memorize it. Uh, you need to, you, I'm more concerned with you guys knowing how to arrive at these numbers and which, you know, uh, which numbers, I'm talking about this, like preferred stock and common stock where they go. But these preceding, um, you know, headings, if you are getting them a little shifted around, the system is going to mark you wrong. So find a way to remind yourself the order that they go in. So stockholders, equity paid in capital, then the capital stock. These two are the capital stock, right? The preferred stock and the common stock. So you're literally just transferring the balance from on, on top um, down. 
and there's the common stock, and then there's a the total. For the people who, who uh, pointed out, I think it was C who pointed out that on a previous, um, or not a previous, sorry, on question seven, there's an error because they're allowing you to put common stock before preferred stock. I did contact the Wiley rep and she just told me to, to report it as a content error, but there's nothing that they can do in this moment to, to fix that. So um, I think we should all just kind of remember that preferred stock has to go before common stock because of the preferential rights, right, of the preferred stockholders. I'm trying to see if I can make this a little bit smaller because it's not fitting properly into the screen. Oops. Okay. Um, so then we've got a total capital stock is these two numbers together, right, added up. And additional paid in capital, you also uh, put the preferred stock number first. Again, all these numbers are just being pulled from on top. There's nothing that you have to do to them. And then the common stock number, then you uh, total the additional paid in capital, you're adding these two numbers together. And then, uh, so it's that, then the, the total paid in capital is the, you know, the capital stock numbers plus the additional paid in capital gives you total paid in capital paid in again which is differentiated from earned capital earned capital is um, retained earnings so now we come to the retained earnings the uh, earned capital the number comes from the question one million one hundred and fifty thousand and then you've got total paid in capital and retained earnings the reason this this balance is called this and not total stockholders equity is because we still have to subtract the treasury stock, right? If we didn't have treasury stock, we would end here and we would call the total stockholders equity. So the, you add these two numbers together to get to um, the total uh, paid in capital and retained earnings, less the treasury stock from the, the question above here, it's saying that you could either put it in parentheses or you could just put it, um, you know, as a regular number because you already say less. Uh, so 4972750, which is my number, minus this number, gives me the final total stockholders equity. So that's the building of a balance sheet, um, you know, just using the numbers that you were given. Again, if you have questions about anything, you can stop me. Um, I'm moving on to the last the last question, which was by far, I guess, uh, was the most time spent for people. And no surprises, this question will be on the test. I already wrote that on the test prep sheet. So if you have problems with this question, um, if you are not sure exactly how you got this question right or whatever, please pay attention. Um, this is on the test. And I, there's not much I can do to change it because it's, uh, you know, it's, the system generates the question. So it's going to look pretty much the same. Um, you know, obviously the numbers will be different, but there's not much that can change in terms of, you know, the different transactions. So I repeat, problem 13, 1, A through C will be on the test. Okay, I know people are always asking what's on the test. It's already on Blackboard. Everything is listed under test and quiz information, but this is there. So Bridgeport was organized on January the 1st. It is authorized to issue. That means it's allowed to issue 14,500 shares of 8%. That's the dividend percentage, $100 par value. We know what that is, preferred stock. So there's a whole lot of words and numbers and stuff like in a very short sentence. Um, do you need to do anything here? No, you're reading, you're waiting now. Since it was organized on January the 1st, it means that they just started. So basically, uh, you know, carrying on from there, they're going to tell you which stock um, transactions, which stock issuances uh, took place. But you shouldn't be, um, I just want to think about anything that people could be doing, you know, wrong. You shouldn't be journalizing any of this stuff up to here. And they're also telling you that it was authorized to issue 464,000 shares of no par common stock, but it has a stated value of $3 per share. So yeah, you have to be careful, right? The, the preferred stock has a par value, the common stock has a stated value. So when you're doing that paid in capital in excess of par, or paid in capital in excess of stated value uh, accounts, you need to keep your wits about you. So there's the $3 stated value. The following stock transactions were completed during the first year. So January the I, I see you, John. Thank you. So January the tenth, they issued 81,500 81, shares of common stock for cash at six dollars per share. So 
number of shares, there's the issue price, and you have to go back, right? And remember that there was a $3 uh, stated value. So, you know, you, you know that. So you don't just dump everything into common stock. What's nice, I guess, about doing this in Wiley is that, you know, you have three lines. So at least it reminds you that there's, there might be something missing if you if you don't use um, paid in capital in excess. So 81,000 times five. So, so here go my numbers. I'm trying to see how I can why this is such a pain. Okay. Uh, debit cash, credit common stock, credit paid in capital in excess of stated value. So this is an even split between um, these two numbers, right? And then the next one issued 4,300 shares of preferred stock at $110 per share. $110 is the issue price. That's what goes to cash times 4,300. The par value is 100 <clears throat> as stated above where you had to read, right? Reading being the, the main thing that I'm talking about today. You had to read to see that there was a $100 par value. You don't have to do anything with the 8%. Remember, that's only if you're calculating dividends. So you don't even bother with that. So 473,000 is the cash, 430,000. So this is the number of shares times the par value, number of shares times the issue price. This paid in capital in excess of par is just the difference between these two numbers, right? It's the excess amount that we uh, that the owners invested. Issue 22,500 shares of common stock for land. The asking price of land was 87,000. The fair value of the land was 83,500. So this is very similar to a question we had when we were practicing. We had said that the land was advertised for a certain amount, I think like 90,000, but the land was only worth 80,000. I may be off on the numbers, but maybe you guys remember the example, right? Something, the asking price, meaning what is advertised for, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it's worth. Okay, you, we have to be clear about that. It tells you what the fair value is. And if you think about the rule around this, when you have the issuance of stock for, for non-cash assets um, or for an expense, you record the transaction at the fair value of the stock or or the fair value of the asset. Um, so the fair value of what is being given up or what is received, whichever is easier to determine. So fair value is what you're focusing on. So words for fair value that you see in this question is what something is worth, fair value, market value, fair market value, those all mean um, the same thing. So the fair value of the land was 83,500. So that's the number that you need to focus on, even though it, the asking price was more than the actual value. I mean, that's also normal. People often advertise uh, properties for more than what um, maybe it gets appraised at. So you debit land for the 83,500, the fair value. The common stock, we go back, it was 22,500 shares at a $3 uh, stated value. So that's the amount, sorry, where am I? 67,500 for common stock. And then you subtract the two and that's your paid in capital in excess of stated value. <clears throat> And then the next few things, I'm not going to, well, this one is, it's kind of the same. So May the 1st is basically the same as January the 10th, right? You're just issuing the stock at a different price. I don't have to go over that. Let's go over August the 1st, issued 12,000 shares of common stock to attorneys in payment of their bill for 40,500 for services performed, helping the company organize its an organization expense. Um, 40,500 is the fair value of the services. That's what they're charging. There is no fair value of the stock. So this is the number you have to go with, right? So debit organization expense, again, you're looking at the number of shares times the stated value for common stocks, so it's 12,000 times three, which is 36,000, and the difference goes into paid in capital in excess of stated value. The rest of the examples, um, I'll just do, yeah, the rest of the examples are the same as before. We've already done an issuance of common stock. We've already done an issuance of preferred stocks. So I don't need to repeat that. What I do want to go into, though, is the posting, right? Post to the stockholders' equity accounts. I did mention this in class, but I know that sometimes it's difficult to remember things until you're actually doing them. Because they're only asking you to post to uh, capital accounts, everything is happening on the credit side, okay? Because you were doing stock issuances, this, the, everything is being credited. So you didn't even need to touch the debit side, and that's okay, right? Some people may feel like it looked weird. Uh, remember when you post, 
you are looking for the name of the account that you are posting to. And whatever you did in the journal, you do in the ledger. So if I'm posting to common stock, I'm going to go down each transaction and try to find the word common stock. I found it over here. I credited common stock with 2,400, uh, 2,000. Two, four, four, five hundred. I don't know why I'm having a problem saying that. So then I look, yeah, common stock, two, four, four, five hundred. I'm crediting it. Everywhere where I credit, so on March the 1st, I credited preferred stock. Um, over here, you can see 430,000, right? I'm going to do exactly the same in the, in the ledger, right? This is, this is the ledger. Um, so you copy and paste. And you can only post to one side of the account. You shouldn't be posting to both sides of the account. That doesn't make sense. Remember, the journal shows both sides of the transaction. It shows the debits and the credits. The ledger is each account separately. And in that account, you only show what you've done to that account specifically. You don't show every, you know, all the parts of, of the different, um, of all the parts of the transaction, excuse me. So it turns out then that everything happens on the credit side. You have to put, you know, the, the dates and then at the end, BAL for balance. And so you're just adding when, it, when things are all on the same side, they just all get added together, right? That's what's happening in the ledger. If this is the plus side of, of uh, all the capital account, if there had been something on the minus side, the debit side, it would be subtracted to get to the final balance, but there's nothing here. So you're just adding everything together. These ending balances are what end up on the balance sheet, all right? The from, if you think about the accounting cycle, right? I know no one really spends maybe, besides me, maybe it's too much time thinking about the accounting cycle. But if you think about the accounting cycle, what you're doing here is part of that cycle, right? You're journalizing, then you're posting to the ledger. The next step would be um, preparing a trial balance, and then you're making the financial statements. For the trial balance, it's going to be all these balances, the ending balances that go there, and then the financial statements are prepared from um, the trial balance. So you're not going to go through the balances again, like when you when you try to make the balance sheet, you don't have to go and look at every balance again, you're just looking at the ending balance. When I used to order, uh, you know, back in the day for Deloitte, um, when we would go into our, our clients to start the audit, they would always give us a trial balance, okay? They don't give us the journal entries. They, I mean, if we asked for a ledger, they would give it to us, but we were really interested in what the ending balances were on, um, on the accounts and we would start our audit from there because we knew that the ending balances were, you know, what would show up on the financials and we needed to make sure that those numbers were fairly stated. So. You preparing the balance sheet in the next step, you're only looking at ending balances. And you, you want to be careful. And again, this question is on the test. Okay, that's why I'm spending some time here talking, 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 talking. But you want to be careful when you when you post these, these numbers that you are, are, you know, attention to detail, that you're bringing the correct number down into the, um, you know, into the ledger and also if you have something wrong at the top over here something's marked in red and you're like oh man you know I, I don't know what the what the problem is um fix that so that you can um end up you know posting appropriately to the ledger I try to um I try to sit I try to do a sitting before uh, on the homework uh, where I said you didn't have to finish one, one part of a question before you move to the next one, but it completely messes up everything because what happened then was that some people couldn't even see the next part of some of the questions. Um, and so I defaulted back to, to how Wiley has it that you basically have to, I think, substantially complete a whole uh, you know, part A before you can go to part B and so on. So, you know, I don't think you can just abandon part A. You kind of have to try your best to, to, to um, finish it so that you can do part B. And then in C, this is this little pesky thing here where it talks about, you know, prepare the paid in capital section as opposed to prepare stockholders equity. So I know people were kind of spinning their wheels, putting paid in cap, I mean, putting stockholders equity over here and wondering why it was being marked wrong. So, Paid in capital is the first line because that's what they're asking you to do. 
if they had asked you to show the additional paid in capital section, that would be the first line and so on, right? So paid in capital, capital stock, we always list the preferred stock first, 600. And so, so I know on your homework, you were somehow allowed to list common stock first and the answer was right. Um, but I, you know, it's obviously not right. So um, when it comes to the, the test, just put preferred stock first. Um, because they are always listed first. Then the common stock, notice again, it's the balance from the end of the ledger. I know you're bored with me saying that already, so I'll move on. These two numbers added together give you a total capital stock, then the additional paid in capital, um, paid in capital in excess of par preferred stock first, again, 78,000, ending balance, then the stated value common stock for 7 to 50. These two numbers added together give you the 485. And then these two together give you the total, not total stockholders equity, total paid in capital of, in my case, 1 million um, 800. Thousand. So that's going to be a hefty amount of points on, on the first test. Um, that's, that's the homework. It's, I expect people, like if you did it for the homework and you do it a few more times over, you should be able to get, um, you get it all correct on the test. But what I find with the test, even though I give people basically double the amount of time that they would normally, that, that they would need to finish a, a test like this, that um, because you have multiple attempts and some people don't study as much as they should because they're like, well, we have lots of attempts, I can just keep trying, that the thing that will cause people to not get um, all the points that are available is that they run out of time, okay? So make sure that you are actually studying and not saying to yourself, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to, you know, wing it or I'm just going to make sure I have this, the answer somewhere near to me or whatever. Um, yeah, you can try to do that. But remember, the numbers are going to be different. Um, and at some point, you also just have to like have personal integrity and ask yourself, like, what am I actually trying to do? Am I trying to learn or am I trying to, you know, just game the system or whatever? Because in, the, in this class and in your other classes, you're practicing to be the professional that you already are to some extent and that you will continue to be as you qualify in whatever work you're doing. And you know you want to be practicing to, to be able to problem solve, to be able to you know, be someone of integrity, to be able to do the work. Um, remember, we won't be online forever. So, so at some point you may even be doing exams, even if you're at Queen's College or Baruch or whatever, be doing closed book exams in class um, without any reference material. So, you know, make sure that you aren't just assuming that you can sit with an open book in front of you and just copy the answers down. That's I've had students tell me, yeah, I thought I could just, you know, I mean, students are often very honest with me. I don't know if it's something, you know, in my face that, that they that they see and they're like, yeah, I, you know, I, I thought I could just look in the textbook or whatever and I completely ran out of time and it was a mess. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I told you not to do because it's, it's not going to work out. How long should a question like this take you? I, I can't say, um, you know, for sure, because students, uh, students study at varied levels if if i'm talking about a student that has studied uh, you know sufficiently for this um for this question and is actually engaged in on wiley and not busy like surfing other websites and things or whatever while they're you know on their phone or looking at instagram or whatever i think that um a question like this can can be done in as little as as 20 minutes and I think if you're, you know, solid 20 to 30 minutes, probably even less. Um, yeah, maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Um, if, you're, if you haven't studied this question, could easily take you over an hour um, and you'll just totally run out of time. Okay, so yeah, so see you asking me that. I, I don't think that, I think that you can probably spend 10 minutes on the journals and then you, you're, bringing the, you're bringing the numbers down from the journals into the, because remember you've seen this question before. So I'm also basing my answer on the fact that you did the homework, you studied, you kind of know what you're doing. The journal is where most of the work is being done. So if you're spending 10, 15 minutes on the journal, maybe another 10, 15 minutes on the rest of it and you're done. Um, 
I'm not saying it should take you 30 minutes. It can take you longer. I'm giving you guys double the time. I'm giving you four hours to do the test. Like you can take your time, but a lot of people um, will not study and think that they can just page through the textbook. And a lot of people I should be more gracious. Some people may not study. Um, and so this question could take them forever. Yes, Denisa. So for the quiz, do we only have one attempt to complete the questions? For the quiz, we're looking for the yes. test. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so let's go and look and see what I said because I don't want to misspeak. I can't remember what I put in. I, I know it's it's not just one attempt because that would be brutal. Um, so let me just see. Okay, so the quiz. Do, 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 do. Or you will, it's four attempts per question. Okay, but you you start losing points after the third attempt for the quiz. And that's very generous because frankly, the quiz only has four options, A, B, C, or D. So the fact that you have four attempts means some people will basically guess, but remember there's a dramatic uh, drop. You can only like after the third attempt, you, the maximum points you can get is 60%, which is not great. But I mean, if you're just guessing that sort of, and I'm not talking to you, uh, Denise, I'm just saying in general. Um, for the test, you have four attempts at each question, but after the second attempt, you will have access to account names in the drop down, and maximum points you can get at that stage is is ninety five percent. So, um, you know, you you can decide because the because the system will always tell you at this point, you know, you can choose to to see something, and then you can say yes or no, right? So you can always still get hundred percent if you choose not to take the the help. Um, after the third attempt, though, your point potential will drop uh, to a maximum score if you if you choose to take the help, right? I'm not saying that it will just automatically drop, but if you choose to take the assistance of, you know, seeing all the account names or you choose to uh, see, I think after the first, um, after the third attempt, you can also, it's not just account names, actually. I think there's something to do with seeing how the question is calculated. I, I need to see if I wrote this right. But there's additional support after the third attempt, because I know at that point, people are like, okay, I only have four attempts and I'm not getting this right. I, I'm willing to take a hit on um, on my score just so that I can actually get uh, some points. So, so in the end, you know, if you take all the help that's available to you, which again, you don't have to, the maximum that you can get on a question is 80, 80%. Am I answering your question sufficiently? You're good, Tanisa? I don't know if you can see. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm a little confused. So if, if I have a question in the test and I try it and it's wrong and I keep trying without using the, mm -hmm. the extra help of the articles or the, of the or the names of the accounts i can be do it as much you as can I no you can try it for two you can you can um you have four attempts okay so <clears throat> you can try it for i think it's uh, up to three attempts without taking the help but after the third attempt your your score is going to drop like it's not i think what you're asking me i want to make sure i think what you're asking me is can you just try for four attempts and you can still get a hundred percent on the thing that's yeah. not gonna that's not gonna happen there will be a drop i think the night the the and and let me go back and just check wiley because i now check in the break I, I also feel like i'm a little bit rusty on this because the last time i i um I discussed something like this was uh, earlier on in the summer with my classes. So I just want to make sure what policies I that the policy that I'm discussing with you is correct in the sense that you can opt into um, you know receiving help or not because I, I from everything that I've seen um, with Wiley, they usually flash something to say, hey, you know, at this point uh, you can get help. But I guess to your point. Um, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to just like faff around and do multiple attempts on a question without having some type of penalty by the fourth time. I'm not saying by the first time, by the fourth time that you're going okay. over. It, it's just that it's, it's helpful, but it's getting so confusing that way that you get so many attempts, but each attempt, it's like something else, different points. 
Um, yeah, but I mean, I have to do something to encourage people to, um, and, and remember when you open up the test, the test will tell you exactly what the policy is. Um, yeah. I have to do, I, I um, you know, it's either this or I say you have one attempt and you're done. And I think that's, yeah, yeah. that's wild. That's much wilder than, it. yeah, that's much wilder than trying to remember that, you know, after the third attempt, I'm going to lose some points. Because some people will study so much that they don't even get to the third attempt. They'll get the question right on the first or second attempt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. I, I think I'll, I'll read it later and I'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah but let me look. Um, like but we're we're, we're going to break now at, because uh, after the break, I'll finish or not, maybe not finish, but I'll, I'll continue with chapter 14. Let me look uh, at how the, how the policies present because I can see the student view. Uh, let me look to see how the policy is presented to you guys. So because I see stuff on, on the instructor side um, based on what I've put in, but that isn't always exactly reflective of, of how the student sees it when they actually open the test, if that makes sense. All right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, we'll, so we'll break now. You guys can come back at 11.45. And um, you know, I'll while while you guys are breaking, I'll stop sharing my screen, and I'll actually just uh, check and see what is going on with uh, um, with with these policies. Now, someone, anyone, I'm going to pause the recording because I'm actually going to be looking at this the policies, and I don't really want to record that part. But um, you know, somebody, when we come back at eleven forty-five, please remind me to resume recording because I don't want to end up with this mess that we had before, where I forgot to record off of the class. Okay, so we'll go and have your break. This is like the worst picture ever. But when I was going into um, into Wiley, there were very few options for how to to pull this information from from the settings page. So I just took a picture with my phone. So I apologize already for, you know, this not looking so great, but we can read it. So let, let's clear up any confusion. And I actually um, rewrote the attempts information on the test and quiz information page as well for the test because I it wasn't um, as clear as it could have been. So this is what's, what's happening. Um, if you, you do your first attempt. And Natasha was also asking a question about this, like how do you get to the second attempt? So let's pretend you're busy with the test, right? It's, it's kind of like the homework in the sense that you make an attempt and then in order to, you know, you decide like, I'm, I'm, I've, I feel like I've answered this question to the best of my ability. I don't know, you know, anything else that I can add. Then you click submit, right? And it's when you click submit that that counts as your first attempt. Once you click submit, you get uh, feedback from the system that may highlight some, you know, some blocks in red, which then means that something is wrong. So at that point, when you start to revise your work, you are in the second attempt, right, of the work. When you're in the second um, attempt, uh, so here's the, the, the way the rules are set. And I have to I have to say, I mean, this is not your problem. This is my problem with Wiley. But when they changed over to new Wiley, for some reason, they, they're only using the word after all the time. Before, um, we used to it just used to say second attempt, and then this is what happens. So, so basically, because there's the word after, um, the way you want to think about it is you make your, your second attempt, and then if, you, if there's still a problem, you have a 5% score reduction if you choose to look at a list, a key list, a list of key, excuse me, accounting terms. So that's going to be some type of information that's going to help you to answer the question. May or may not be as helpful as you would like, but um, but that's what's available in the system for me to give you help, right? This the only things I have available is you know the correct answer, which I'm obviously not going to give you after the second attempt. If you have four attempts, I can give you access to the book, but I'm also not going to do that because this isn't it's uh, you know that's distracting because you should really be trying to answer the question as quickly as possible. The solution now, so, so now moving away from after the second attempt, you can choose to have a list of accounting terms that might help you. I think the, um, 
the drop down list names of accounts are there anyway. I think the, the list of accounting terms is, is something different. I can't see the student view. I can only see the test. And when I see the test, I see, you know, the accounting, the, the account names. Uh, I can also confirm all of this with a wide area if, if people are still worried at this point. So, so by attempt one and two, you can still get 100%. If you don't choose to use these accounting terms, you don't have to. By the third, once people have done their third attempt and they're now stuck, right, and still can't get to the right answer, my assumption is that you have done a lot of work at that point, but there's probably like one or two things that you just can't get right to get yourself you know over the finishing line so what I say at that point is after the third attempt you will have access to the solution that doesn't mean that I'm expecting that you're now just going to copy and paste the solution into your work because you've already been doing work and at that point they, if you do choose to access the, the solution you'll have a 15 percent reduction in your grade so at, you know, at that point, if you didn't use the accounting terms, you're still, um, it's still possible for you to get 85% maximum if you get the whole question right. But if you don't get the question right because you ran out of time and you're not able to revise your answer, whatever, you get whatever the grade is that you earned um, on that question. All right, I hope that this helps to, you know, unmuddy the waters a little bit. I think what you guys need to focus on is the following. When you do work, if you're not yet ready to submit the work while you're doing the test, please save your work because we know that all kinds of stuff go wrong. So you don't have to submit uh, for your work to be saved. There's a save option or submit option. If you choose not to submit anything, um, you know, while you or you forget to submit stuff, if you have saved your work, the system will auto submit. But if you go through and this has happened to students, despite how many times I, I say these things, um, you know, in the heat of the test, I know sometimes people, people get so stressed out and they don't think about it. Um, if you do the work and you um, and you don't save and you don't submit, and you get locked out of your account or the time runs out or something because you didn't save anything, when you go back in, there will be nothing there. You have to save your work as you go along. Saving your work doesn't amount to submitting it. A submission is when you know the, the, the attempts start uh, getting counted. So after the first attempt, no reduction. After the second attempt, uh, there will only be a reduction if you choose to use a list of key accounting terms. After the third attempt, you have the, you know, remember it's maximum four attempts. After the third attempt, going into the fourth attempt, which is your final attempt, you do have the option of accessing the solution to see where it might be where you have something that, you know, you're still not getting. Um, and then that's it. For the quiz, I did check the quiz um, information. It's the same as what I said. You have um, four attempts, but after the third attempt, the maximum grade you can get on the question is 60, 60%. Follow up questions there. All right. So I know it's um, I know it's maybe a little bit like uh, C was saying, and I get it. It's a little bit like ah, you know, what do I do? But remember, uh, Wiley does prompt you. Um, you know, this is your okay. Yeah, I remember Scotland. Um, Wiley does prompt you to um, to say that you know you're going into another attempt or whatever. The the biggest tragedy that I've seen though is people who are so scared to submit anything, but they're also not saving their work. And then uh, you know I've had like panicked emails where people are like, oh my word, I I I can't find anything because I moved on to the next question or whatever, and now um, none of my work is saved. So please don't do that. All right. Ahora me hace un un sticker de esto que diga water. Sorry. Water. Oh, water. Ivan. Ivan, I don't think you were speaking to me, but if you were, you can unmute yourself. Um, okay. So that's that's the deal with with the test and the quiz. So I tried to rewrite the, the stuff. I, I need to make sure that I wrote after because this um, the notion of things happening after is um, is what's new to me in the old. Oh, I, I do see your hand, Shafak. Just give me a minute. I just want to make sure first of all, that I can actually see the edit button. And then while I'm thinking about this, let me just amend the situation here if I if needed. 
after the second attempt after the third. Okay, so I did write it the way it's written in um, Wiley. Yes, Shafak, go ahead. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask, uh, just in case, if I want to um, do first few questions later and start with the last few questions first, or is there any situation when I want to just do, you know, other questions before mm -hmm. the first few? So is it mm -hmm. possible or would I just lose points if I do that? You know, I, I've not heard of people losing points. You're saying, can I skip over like question one and two and start with question like that, right? Yeah. And then, and then come, come back. back and do, yeah. I I will uh, again. I'm you know I'm I'm not in the student view and I can't go into the student view because the test is locked until the twenty sixth. But um, let me see if I can create like a. a a fake test or something and see if I can move through. I don't see why not, because you're just clicking from one question to the next and then coming back. But, um, you know, I found some strange things with new Wiley Plus, uh, like sometimes things that logically I didn't understand why they made that choice. So I'm a little bit, you can notice my hesitation, I'm a little bit hesitant to to say that you can just go back and forth, you know, with impunity. Let me, I'm going to make a note here. Let me ask the Wiley rep. Um, I'm going to ask okay. her two things. I'm going to ask her, can you guys navigate back and forth, right? Without being forced, without being minute. forced to do, to submit, um, yeah, to submit the question. And the other one is, will the system definitely prompt you uh, prompt you about um, about assistance and you have an option to click yes or no instead of just giving you the assistance if you don't want it, right? I think those are two questions that I need to just firm up with. Her. So thanks for asking that. Let me get back to you um, and and I'll, I'll let you know at that point what she says. Thanks. Okay. All right. Anything else test-wise? This is good stuff. Um, you know, let's rather have this conversation now than you know at you know 5 45 p.m. on the day of the deadline of the test. Um, <clears throat> all right. So if there's nothing else, we have to kind of you know mentally shift gears now back to chapter 14. And uh, the last few things that we need to do in chapter 14, um, specifically uh, talking about, about the retained earnings statement, like how to, and, and I mean, the book does it more like a calculation than an actual statement, but, you know, looking at it in, in kind of, this, in kind of a, a very systematic approach helps to understand how to calculate the retained earnings balance. So we've got retained earnings that we need to look at. Then we've got um, the income statement that we're going to deal with and also a little bit of um, calculating ratios. And so... <clears throat> We've said this a number of times, retained earnings is net income or loss that the company holds back. We also saw now with our work in chapter 14 um, that you know, retained earnings is um, affected and basically decreased by cash or stock dividends. And also that just you just saw it when I was going over the chapter 13 homework that um, net income gets close to retained earnings. And so anything that happens in net income um, is, you know, going to affect retained earnings in some way. So I'm going to write this uh, over here in our trusty little class example workings document. Um, well, if I can ever get to the end of this document. Okay. So I just want to uh, kind of give the I, the sorry I'm not spelling this right give you the the way in which we think about <clears throat> how to calculate retained earnings right retained earnings calculation for the year in balance the way we're going to think about it is what is the beginning right what is the beginning balance of retained earnings. So it's usually, I mean, if the, if the company is following a calendar, yeah, it's at January the 1st, okay? Then we, if we found an error from a previous year, right? If we found an error, error from a previous, previous year, what we will do is we will call it a prior period, very fancy way of saying it, prior period adjustment, this could be positive or negative. It depends on the 
it depends on the error, okay? Then that, that equals, once you do that adjustment, that equals an adjusted, okay? Retained earnings balance. And so now you come to, you either add net income or subtract, right? Subtract uh, net loss from the retained earnings. This is, again, this is how I'm calculating retained earnings. Then you subtract cash, dividends, and stock dividends. And I know in the book it talks about, you know, uh, the subtracting certain amounts related to a sale of treasury stock below cost. Don't worry about that. We're not going to cover that. Um, we don't need to cover that. So we subtract the, the cash dividend and stock dividend, and this then equals the ending balance of retained earnings. Again, you know, ending balance, I'm just going to assume that they're using a calendar year. So December 31st. So as we're going through the, you know, the discussion and we're going through the questions and stuff, um, you know, this is easy. This number is, is given. Um, the income or loss is usually also given. And, you know, maybe you have to do a little calculation around cash or stock dividends, but it's the prior period adjustment that usually causes some uh, confusion for people because, yeah, you have to think about uh, the relationship between um, net income and retained earnings. And, and that's usually, you know, a problem. So for the prior period adjustment, um, right? This is usually uh, usually due to an error that either made net income too high or too low, right? And so retained earnings was also too high or too low in the previous year we now need to fix the error by either adding uh, to or subtracting from not net income, but retained earnings. So how do we know what to do? You have to look at the relationship between um, net income, well, revenue, the impact of revenue and expense on, um, on net income, right? So revenue, revenue increases net income, right? We're just gonna work with net income. Don't worry about the loss. It's obviously the opposite direction, but that's that's just gonna make it even harder to understand this. Revenue incre increases net income and expenses decrease net income, okay? This is what you need to remember. So remember when we're thinking about errors, remember that revenue increases net income and expenses decrease net income. So in the first example that we'll do together, I think there's a there's a depreciation um, situation where there was an error in depreciation and the and the expense was was lower than it should have been. So um, we need to figure out what that means, right? For um, for making the correction. And remember last time I was saying that uh, fixing an error can become a little bit complicated because you have to think about what mistake was made. Then you have to think about what should have been done. And then you have to think about, you know, how to fix the books so that you can get from what was wrong to the correct answer. And so it's, it's not always just simple to say, oh, well, this was supposed to happen, so I'll just do that. You actually have to think about what's already in the books and how do I fix um, fix the balance? So that's kind of just like the preamble to the question that we'll do yes soon, uh, uh, you know, to calculate retained earnings. But I'm I'm writing out that stuff to just show you guys that you know it's it's not part of this part of this work is really 
quote unquote easy because you you know it's a beginning balance it's a net income number that you have to add or subtract either you get given the dividend number or you maybe have to do a small calculation to calculate cash dividends or stock dividends but if you do get given a prior period adjustment you that's that's really the place where you have to stop and think okay well you know what happened to retained earnings when we made this error and how do i fix it so let's go to exercise seven and i'll do this with you um make sure that we kind of solidify our understanding and note that um you know when you read the book they don't really prepare a formal retained earnings statement in the book and part of the reason for that is that if they had to do that they would have to show the entire stockholders equity statement because most companies really um have something that's stockholders equity statement but they actually have columns for all the different types of accounts that that make up a stockholders equity and show the changes in the accounts um you know for the year and so retained earnings would be one of those one of those columns so i guess the authors of the book have have taken the approach that they're not going to show um and they they used to but but now i guess they they decided they're not going to actually show the, the the calculation as you know beginning balance ending whatever they're just going to show how you get to the ending number but um you know you guys still have to know how to do these calculations and it's easier to think about you know which numbers increase or decrease retained earnings so i'm going to stick with kind of calculating the number in the format of a statement but you'll see when you do the homework and so on it just asks you what's the ending balance on retained earnings but without knowing how the, the retained earnings statement looks you may not know how to get to the ending balance so i'm kind of taking the long way around in this uh, case but i think it's going to be to your benefit so general microwave this is exactly the same example as what's in your textbook i believe i mean the years are different but it's fine um so if you get stuck you can always go look at the textbook again general microwave has a retained earnings balance of 800000 at december the 31st 2017 so that's the ending balance for 2017 which also becomes the beginning balance for 2018 so in january 2018 so we are, we're in the new year now general microwave discovers that it understated depreciation in 2017 by 300,000 due to computational, which is the same as calculation errors. So they're asking us to prepare the journal entry for the correction of this error and assume that net income for 2018 is 650,000. So they give you the net income number, prepare the retained earnings statement for the year in the December 31, 2018. So <clears throat> first let's just see what we've been given and make sure that we understand what it represents. If we think about beginning balance for retained earnings in 2018, the 800,000 is the beginning balance. Any balance from one year is the beginning balance of the next year, right? We know that there's going to be a prior period adjustment because it told us that the question told us that there was a mistake. We just don't know if the prior period adjustment is going to be a plus to retained earnings or a minus from retained earnings. We'll have to think that through. And then we were given a net income number that um, we will add to retain earnings to get to the balance. There's no dividends discussed here, so we can assume that dividends are, are not in play, so we'll treat them as zero. But before we even do the retain earnings statement, we're being asked to prepare the journal entry to correct the error. So when you record, um, and so I'll, I'll go over here and, and kind of do this example seven in its own space, right? Uh, when we record depreciation, right, the journal entry, how people so remember this, the journal entry is depreciation, debit depreciation expense. This is from, you know, chapter 10 in accounting one or even chapter three in accounting one and credit accumulated depreciation, right? That's that's how you uh, that's how you record depreciation. Hopefully, this rings a bell. So, what they're saying when they're talking about the error is that when they did this journal entry, they made the depreciation expense too low by three hundred. Understated means that it was too low by three hundred thousand. So, let's just say. Um, you know, let's just say that the erroneous 
journal entry, you know, I'm, I'm making this up as I go along, so bear with me. Let's just say that the erroneous journal entry was, um, you know, uh, 200,000 depreciation expense, 200,000 accumulated depreciation. What should have, this is what they're saying, it's what should have happened is the following. And just try to follow with me. You know, you don't know if you don't want to write down stuff now, it's fine. What should have happened was that this number should have been 300,000 more than it was before. So it should have been 200,000, which is the number that they actually put in, plus 300,000. It should have been 500,000, but they made it too little. So now this is what I mean about thinking about an error, right? This is what is there. This is already, this is what has been recorded. Right? What should have, maybe I shouldn't have said happened. I should have probably said what should have been recorded. So it's a little bit more formal. What should have been recorded is 500,000. So it's clear that the difference is 300,000, right? And so the difference is 300,000. Increase, right? Needed. Now we've already, the year has passed, right? This was in 2017. The year has passed. Depreciation expense. Expense would have been closed off to income summary at the end of 2017. And income summary closed off to retained earnings. Just bear that in mind. So if we wanted to make a correction, right? Here's the correcting journal entry. Your knee jerk may be to say debit. This is what you might think you need to do. Debit depreciation expense with the difference, right? 300,000, oops, sorry, am I in the right place? No, I'm not. Debit depreciation expense with 300,000 and credit accumulated depreciation with the same. Now, accumulated depreciation is a permanent account, so it will still be there and we are allowed to credit it, but we are not allowed to credit depreciation expense because the depreciation expense account is no longer in existence for 2017. I don't, I don't mean that the account itself is not in existence. That balance is gone. It's been, um, it's been uh, closed off already to income summary. So the account that we should use, right, in this case is retained. Let me see if I can do this without a strike through. <laughs> I've probably now like, so you, you can't use, I guess you've seen this, right? Strike through depreciation expense, can't do that. So this is the correct entry. You're going to do retained earnings, 300,000, and you're going to say accumulated depreciation, 300,000, okay? So this is the correcting entry. So that's the answer. That also happens to be the answer for A. Sorry that it's so super yellow, um, but I, I've said a lot of things and I wanna make sure that people are seeing what the final answer is. So what, what did we say? We did something wrong. It ended up being that depreciation expense was too low by 300,000. Depreciation expense goes into uh, the income statement. You know, it gets closed off to income summary, all of that good stuff. The number should have been higher by 300,000. We wish that we could just do another journal entry and say debit depreciation expense 300,000, but we can't because that account for 2017 has already been closed off. So in 2018, right? This is in 2018. Um, and maybe I should say this, this is a correcting entry in 2018, we are going to debit retained earnings, which is actually where the depreciation expense eventually ends up and still credit accumulated depreciation because that is a permanent account that does not get closed out at the end of the year. Yeah. Questions, anybody?
All right. So I assume that people kind of know what's going on, right? Okay. So that's the first part. Um, oh, sorry, it, it was labeled one. So that's uh, part one, not A. That's part one. And then part two is uh, the retained earnings statement. So again, like I said, the book is, is not you know, doing a full statement. I'm just doing it because it's easier to get to the ending balance by actually having a formal uh, process. I'm not gonna bother with like the name of the company and retained earnings and statement and so on. You'll see, um, you'll see that, uh, in, that in the solutions to this, I've, I've done like a formal statement, but I'm, I'm just really interested in you guys being able to just follow. Remember what I spoke about over here, right? The beginning balance, the prior period adjustment and so on. So that's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do the beginning balance. This was given already in the question. It's 800,000. So the beginning balance on January the 1st, let me just write it down. And one, 2018, sorry. I'm typed right now for some reason. Okay, so that's going to be 800,000. Then you've got the prior period right? adjustment and this debit to retain earnings over here means that you have to subtract, okay? So you can even put to remind yourself less because it's a subtraction. Remember retained earnings is a capital account. So if you're debiting it, you're subtracting 300,000. And so, you know, just to make this super clear, I'm just gonna put 500,000 so if you can see here, right? That this is the adjusted balance. And to that, you will add the net income that is given in the question, 650,000. And there's no dividends, there's no cash dividends, um, there's no stock dividends. You don't even have to uh, include anything around that. So you just get an ending balance um, over here of uh, 1,150,000. And so for your homework, like I said, um, they often, I think there's two questions like this, the, the third last and the second last question, they ask you to calculate just the ending balance. So this is what you're looking for. That's what you'll type in, but you have to go through, you know, all of, of the steps to get to that number, which is why I'm showing you the steps. Does anybody have questions about this? Uh, professor, uh, it's not exactly related to this uh, exercise, but I wanted to know where exactly can I find this sheet? Because usually when I try to look up the work that we did in class, I end up finding the solutions and the questions only, but not yeah. the ones with the okay. information. So Shafak, so watch where I'm going now. Okay, I'm going into Blackboard. I'm going to Zoom meeting materials and I am going to docs this. You got to click on this link. This is the Google doc. Oh, okay. I every one of them, in. every one of them has it's a, it's a it's a live document because I'm constantly updating it. So you got to go through the link. Okay, because okay. I thought I usually used to go through additional notes and exercises, which is why. Yeah, which is basically it. a repeat of these things because I, I put it here initially, then I realized that people weren't really looking here. So I put the I put the notes and stuff under Zoom meeting material so that people would know mm -hmm. what's needed for the next lesson. But this is the document that I'm working in live. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's a Google Doc. Thanks for asking that. Uh, there's probably like, five other people that also don't know where to go. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, and remember, I just wanna be clear here uh, that th the same document exists for chapter 13. So um, you guys can certainly go in there to see what I was doing with some of those other questions from chapter 13. All right, um, so let me do a, a question with you, let me see. Oh, actually, let me just have you battle through a question, <laughs> battle through a question on your own um, to at least see what you do and don't um, remember from what I just said, right? Look at ex uh, exercise nine. Uh, exercise eight is kind of easy because it's just 
adding dividends, which we know dividends are subtraction. But exercise nine actually has a prior period adjustment and it also, um, also has dividends. So I'm gonna read it, but then I'm gonna give you time to try and do it on your own. Nevada Corporation has retained earnings of 2.1 million on January the 1st, 2018. So that's the beginning balance, right? During the year, Nevada earned 1.5 million of net income. So we know based on what we just learned that net income would be added to the beginning balance, uh, you know, as you work towards getting the ending balance of, of retained earnings. It declared and paid a $300,000 cash dividend from everything that we know from before. Remember, um, dividends are a reduction, they decrease retained earnings. In 2018, Nevada recorded an adjustment of 200,000 due to an erroneous overstatement of 2017 depreciation. So if you compare that to what we had before, there was an understatement of depreciation. Now there was an overstatement. So try to just think about what that means for the adjustment. That, so you do have a prior period adjustment of 200,000. You have to decide whether that's an addition or a subtraction. Prepare a retained earnings statement for the year in the December 31, 2018. So for those who don't have this document at their disposal, take a picture or do whatever you need to do or write down the key items. I'll give you a minute to just um, take that picture or something. And then um, I'm gonna have, have you guys uh, take about somewhere in the arena of five, five or six minutes. Um, maybe that's, maybe, let's say seven minutes to, to do this question. Um, and then we'll have someone walk us through it, okay? so. By 1221, you should have taken a picture, okay, of, of the question if you need that picture. I'm going to revert to the previous solution now so people can see how I built, you know, the retained earnings statement. And you're using the information from exercise nine to make a retained earnings statement. And you have until 1228 to do that.
All right, that's time on um, on the example. It's okay if you didn't uh, finish. I'm actually going to take a few minutes and just make sure I've, I'm finishing the attendance. If people are still busy, carry on with the example, but I also need um, someone to uh, volunteer to give me the answer, okay? But while you think about volunteering, I'm, I'm just gonna make sure I have I have most of the attendance, but there are a few people that I need to make sure if they're actually here, okay? So just bear with me. All right, so the people I'm looking for are Wen Chen. I haven't seen on this call. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing you, but Wen, I haven't seen. Um, I've not seen Lance. Lance, are you here? Lance? Nope. Andrew is not here. Zanetta Ramcharan? Nope. And Walter? I also don't see on the call today is a lot of absences and Lewis Taveras. Okay, so everybody else is here. Um, I just wanted to make sure that these people that I didn't see that I wasn't missing them while I was looking at um or I wasn't seeing the full list of participants while we were doing this example. Is there anybody who wants to take a stab at um at answering number nine? That's fine if you're not 100 percent sure on what's going on. We'll work through it together. Anybody? A hand or a voice in the wilderness? No one? I want to call on someone, but I can if it comes to that. Who's talking to me? Yeah. No, you don't have to apologize if you don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to answer. Um, one more minute asking for asking for a friend, that friend being me, that you help a friend out to answer this question. Oh. Perfect. I'm gonna try, but <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. No, I love it. I love it. No, it doesn't matter. That's it's low stakes, Jahomi. Low stakes. Okay. So no worries. Tell me what to do. I'm I'm all yes. Um, hold on, because I'm going. To yeah, yeah. The okay. I'm still. I know I wrote it, but still. <sighs> okay. So we put Nevada Corporation, mm -hmm. then we put uh, retained earnings okay. of the year. Um, so we put year ending 2018. Yeah, I mean, you can do all this. Uh, it's at least or for just the year the retained ending. earning statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can put retained earnings statement and then it is for the year ended uh, um, because you're doing a whole... Um, you're, you're doing the whole from beginning to end, so it would be for the year end. Um, for in this case, I'm not too worried about, um, you know, about the headings because, like I said, the book has kind of departed from doing a formal statement. But you're right so far, Jeremy. So 
thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> All right. <good. laughs> What's next? <laughs> so then we put January 1st. Yes. Um, retained earnings, uh, 2,100,000. Yeah. Sorry, for some reason I can't start balance. So January 1st, 2018, you're putting uh, 2,100,000. That is correct. Um. Okay, and then what we'll do next is the net income. Okay, well, do you want to do anything about the error that happened in the previous period? What did you do with that? Or did you do anything with that? It's okay if you didn't. Remember there was an error with uh, depreciation? Oh, okay, so... So, no, so usually we put the error, we fix the error first so that we can say what the balance should have been and then we'll add net income and deduct the dividend and so on. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess then we do, the we adjust it 200,000. Mm -hmm. So subtracting that from the sure 2 million. Are you sure you want to subtract? This is the hardest part of the question, so don't don't worry that it's that I'm <laughs> that I'm saying that it's not a subtraction. Oh, so we're not subtracting. We're adding. You know, it, it's adding. not okay. it's not automatically a subtraction. Um, you have to look at what the error was. So what happened here was that they made the depreciation too high, okay. which means that they made net income too low in the previous year because remember depreciation is an expense so yes. depreciation was too high and i'm actually going to write it here for the people that want to follow on this document depreciation expense uh, my typing is awful today depreciation expense in 2017 was too high that's what this over overstated means right so yep, okay. net income was too low because remember expenses move in the opposite direction to income. So if the expense is too high, the net income was too low and retained earnings would also be too low, was also too low because remember net income gets closed off. Okay. To retain earnings. So to fix this, you're on it. I can hear in your voice that you understand to fix this. Well, I'm writing everything down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We need to add the amount of the error on to the to, mm -hmm, okay. retained okay. earnings in 2018 to get to the correct beginning. Um, so this is different from the one we had uh, before because with that one, the depreciation was too low. And so it's all the opposite, the, you know, the opposite thing happened with this one, because it was too high, you now have to add this amount back, 200,000 add. Okay, okay, so we add back, okay. Yeah, so it's hard, the prior period adjustment, it's always, it's, I mean, it's like life, right? If you've got to fix, you did something wrong, you did something bad, or whatever, you got to go in and fix it. It's, you know, it's a whole undoing of, of what happened before. So it's hard to think it through, but you have to, be, you have to remember the relationship between expenses and income, because the expense was too high, the income was too low, so, so retained earnings was too low all in 2017. So now in 2018, we got to push up that retained earnings number to get it back to what it should have been okay okay yes now tell me to add net income so yes now you add the net income of one million five hundred perfect anything else you want me to do uh yes the last thing uh would be would it be the cash dividend yes what do you want to so do with that? Keep that? So we have to subtract 300,000. Yeah, because yes. dividends, dividends decrease the amount of income that is being retained in the company. So Correct. we now will get to our total. So it's going to be this number plus the net income minus the dividend. 3,500,000, that's the ending, or that's the balance, December, balance, December 31, 2018.
There you go. Wasn't okay. so bad, right? It was, <laughs> but it's okay. I'm, it I'm was fine. bad. <laughs> if, if, if you know, if you want to get into my head a little bit, like from a teacher's perspective, this is the best thing. This is the best thing that can happen for me because it allows me to go over the concepts again. If you got everything right, then I'd have nothing to say. And then the people who are still struggling won't have an opportunity to hear the, the thinking behind it. So don't feel bad about it. And remember, yep. we... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Remember, we get it wrong now. Then there's less chance to get it wrong in the future. I know. Now I'm never gonna forget that part <laughs> when adding the prior. I'm never yeah. gonna forget that. Part. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you for for participating and putting me out of my misery of thinking I have to do it all by myself. I appreciate it. No um, problem. <laughs> all right. So that's the um. You know, that's the answer, guys. Um. And I think you would do well if you are thinking that this prior period adjustment business is a little bit hard to understand. Just compare these two examples to each other and see how the language differs, right? For how they say the error, what was the error under overstated? It comes back to my theme of the day. We're going to read the question closely to make sure we understand what they are saying about what, um, what actually took place. So that's example nine. Um, we don't have much time left, so I'm not going to push us here. And, and in fact, we're ahead of uh, schedule, so don't panic. We'll finish chapter 14 um, fairly quickly. I just want to give anybody who's still writing something down an opportunity to do that. So I'll I'll move away from this uh, this page at 12.40, or if 12.40 comes sooner, just a, a, a few extra seconds. So take this down or take a picture or whatever you're doing to keep track of your of the work. And again, you can access this document um, by clicking on the link on Zoom um, meeting materials. All right, so what's left? Um, again, what's left is not necessarily what we're doing today because I think we've done enough, but um, pardon me, but we have, um, one bit of, of ratios that we would calculate to see the return on equity. I'll talk it through and then when we get uh, get together next time, we'll actually do the example. So basically sometimes when people invest in, um, you know, investing in a company, they actually wanna know uh, what percentage return, you know, how much money did I make on this? So we usually speak about that in terms of percentages, not in terms of dollars, because when you say, oh, I made $10, you made $5, it doesn't really say much about how much each one of us invested. So we express the return as a, as a percentage. So how, so, uh, you know, the, the formula is uh, how many dollars of net income, you know, the company retur returned to, to common stockholders for the average amount that they invested. And the way we calculate it is the question would give us a net income number. We have to see if there's any preferred dividends. Notice how the preferred dividend amount is subtracted over here, because what that's saying is the company may have made net income of, you know, 200 million, but of that amount, because preferred stockholders have a, a preference, they, they have to be paid first. Even though a dividend hasn't necessarily been declared, we still have to set aside the amount that would have gone to preferred stockholders um, if a dividend was declared because that money belongs to them. So then the rest of whatever's left over, um, you know, we say, okay, this is how much money the company made. This is how much belongs to preferred stockholders. This is what is attributable to common stockholders and divide that by the amount that they actually put in. How much percent did they make on their investment? Does that mean that they're getting all the net income paid out as dividends? Absolutely not. I mean, we saw some of the some of the profits that, you know, some of these stocks uh, make, you know, it's billions of dollars. They're not paying you out <laughs> all the money that they're making. In fact, some of them don't even pay a dividend. So um, all we're saying is uh, you get an idea by doing this calculation of, you know, for what I put in, what is the company making, even if I'm not seeing that money in cash. So you can compare your investment to, you know, things like, oh, if I put the money in the bank, what would I earn? Basically almost nothing because the interest rates are so low. If I put the money in another business or whatever the case may be, you can actually do some comparison. So that's the return on equity. It's example 10 we'll do next time. For those of you who are reading ahead, the last thing that we'll 
able to do is income statement um, presentation or preparation. It's a classic uh, multi-step income statement, sales, less cost of goods sold, there's gross profit, minus the operating expenses, et cetera. But the biggest difference with the income statement for corporations versus um, the others that you've seen is that there will be a line item for income tax expense because the corporation is actually taxed in its capacity, right? It's not just the owners that are being taxed. So that was kind of just the highlights of, of what's coming next time. Um, I'll see you on Tuesday and we'll finish up this chapter and we will then, um, let me just check, I, I always have to keep these dates straight. Yeah, so I'll see you on the 19th. We'll finish up this chapter and then we'll start chapter 15. And then, you know, as you guys go through the homework for chapter 14, uh, which is due on the 26th, make sure that you contact me if you're having any issues. So um, I have everybody's attendance. Um, I'll stop the, I'll stop the